So with our first session, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists of our first discussion, how care and research have changed during COVID-19. Professor Jerry McElvaney, the lead panelist for this discussion, is chairman of the Department of Medicine and professor of medicine at the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, Ireland. He is joined by Dr. Robert Sandhouse, clinical director for the Alpha One Foundation, Professor David Parr, who is a practicing consultant respiratory physician at universities, hospitals, Coventry and Warwickshire, and he is Honorary Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Warwick Medical School. Dr. Mariano fernandez Aquire is the Associate Director of Sanchandrilo Hospital, a public respiratory disease center in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He special, specializes in pulmonology and internal medicine. Finally, Shane Fitch, President and CEO of Fundacion Lovexair in Spain and Portugal, is with us, and she's the parent of an Alpha One person. Dr. McElvaney, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Randall. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank the organization for inviting me here to what I think is an essential part of the Alpha One uh, remit, which is uh, talking to our patient populations and as many people with Alpha One as possible, uh, in addition to their caregivers and, and their friends and relations. So I'd like to start off by asking Sandy how care and research has changed for him during COVID-19. Thank you. I'm happy to kind of give my perspective uh, uh, from my multiple hats, uh, both working for the foundation and Alphanet and uh, my faculty position at the University of Colorado based at National Jewish Health in Denver. Um, others can uh, go into more detail about uh, what happened at the foundation and Alphanet, but I will say that we quickly closed down since we have a large number of employees, especially at Alphanet who are Alpha One patients. Um, we remain closed physically, um, but uh, with people working at home. But the uh, probably the most um, interesting aspect is that our uh, uh, 70 coordinators who are all Alpha One patients working at Alphanet were working at home before there was ever such a thing as COVID-19. Um, and so their lives changed very little other than the um, uh, loss of in-person training that was really uh, part of the uh, excitement of working at Alphanet, and we hope to start that. But what I'd really like to focus on is my work at, uh, at National Jewish and what National Jewish has done. For those who don't know, National Jewish is a uh, tertiary care facility specializing in, uh, in respiratory disease. We get referrals from all over the country. Um, we've had, an, I started the Alpha One Clinic there just uh, under 40 years ago, um, and it's one of the largest uh, uh, in the world uh, at this point. But when uh, early in 2020, National Jewish shut down all their pulmonary clinics um, and uh, changed the, uh, uh, our clinic uh, facility to have two primary clinics, the Acute Respiratory Clinic which uh, managed uh, pa outpatients who uh, were diagnosed with COVID-19 and the Respiratory Recovery Clinic, which managed patients uh, during the recovery process from COVID-19. In addition, National Jewish um, staffs, most of the intensive care units in the uh, Denver uh, and Front Range area. And so our critical care department was uh, remarkably quickly overwhelmed. Um, but just the same, we sent uh, critical care uh, pulmonologists to both the East Coast and the West Coast when Denver's uh, um, uh, incidence of COVID was um, on the lower side early in the pandemic. Um, and that allowed not only allowed us to help the short staffing of hospitals in New York and San Francisco and Seattle, um, but it also uh, gave those critical care docs experience uh, that they brought back to Denver uh, when the uh, wave of uh, COVID uh, engulfed the country. Um, uh, since that time, uh, we've also uh, uh, started adding back our usual respiratory clinics as uh, vaccination uh, started to become widely available um, for uh, most of the uh, mid portion of the pandemic. If if we consider that this is the towards the end of the pandemic, we can only hope. Um, for most of that time, we had we ran uh, pretty much 12 hour a day drive through vaccination and testing units that anyone from Denver could come to uh, or the surrounding area. Um, 
And it, uh, the, the main disruption to me, since as an elderly physician on staff, I was forbidden from seeing COVID patients, um, uh, was the impact on our research program. We have a major uh, research center that deals with uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, self-initiated uh, pulmonary research and, and uh, immunology research, as well as uh, commercial spons commercially sponsored research. And when the uh, pandemic began, all of our uh, clinical research activity was shut down. Um, our our um, kind of restrictions on research have remained very, very much in place to this day. We have opened up um, mo most of our clinical research programs to local patients who don't have to travel or stay in hotels um, or uh, um, have overnight stays. Um, and so unlike other centers that have relied on um, sending out visiting nurses to patients' homes or um, opened up to out-of-state patients, we're still restricted to only uh, enroll subjects who uh, live in the local area, which has greatly uh, um, impaired our ability to enroll in clinical trials. Um, so uh, I, I present this only as one example of the ways that healthcare systems and research has uh, had to modify its activities um, during COVID. Um, we think we have done a good job of keeping patients safe, managing patients who have disease, and um, taking care of the critically ill. Um, all of that uh, patient care um, was done by others at my institution while I sat back and, and felt guilty about um, only working in the clinical research unit uh, during those days. Um, so hopefully, uh, uh, as as we are all praying and and uh, and working and striving to get the pandemic under control, in spite of strange politics in the United States, um, we uh, will start to uh, come back to normal uh, in the near future. Very good. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, David, any of your thoughts on on COVID and how you dealt with it? So um, yeah, I. Um, I... I think it's uh, it's fascinating uh, to hear Sandy's account of things. I suspect that if you were to talk to uh, different doctors in the same hospital or different doctors in different hospitals, you would get hugely varied accounts of, of, of what happened. Um, if we think back to how the whole situation started uh, in the early spring in 2020, which was when it started becoming a, a, a concern in the UK, there was very little information known about COVID, but there was a lot of uh, natural concern amongst the pulmonologists that whilst we didn't know much about the virus, uh, it was likely that patients with lung disease would be some of the most susceptible and as a consequence, uh, we took action um, to protect our patients. And I was actually due to go on holiday uh, in March. It's the, the highlight of my year to go skiing in Austria. And um, uh, I could see that this was on the horizon. So before I went on holiday, the first thing I did was switch all of my uh, outpatient appointments to telephone appointments. This was in February. And I think most of my colleagues thought I was crazy. Uh, and as I was watching what was going on from the ski slopes uh, worldwide, particularly in Italy, which was literally just over the top of the, the mountain range where we were skiing, we could see exactly how devastating it was. And it seemed to be that the UK was sleepwalking into disaster. And uh, at the end of my holiday, when I returned, we didn't seem to have changed very much so i was glad that all my outpatient appointments had been switched to telephone appointments and to, to, to me that was uh, not that much of a a, a a change in practice because i'd been running outpatient appointments for some of my clinics uh, as virtual appointments for a number of years so i have clinics in interstitial lung disease pulmonary embolic disease and pulmonary vascular disease uh, as well as alpha one lung cancer um, COPD and complex airways diseases like bronchiectasis and bronchiolitis. A lot of these patients have got very severe chronic lung disease that they're on immunosuppressive treatment. And 
my concern was that the majority of my patients were likely to be at significant risk if they if they um, caught COVID. So that was that was what happened pretty much in our hospital. And similarly to to Sandy, uh, we decided that that uh, it would make sense to. Uh, allocate certain staff to certain roles. So being one of the oldest, I'm now the oldest in the department um, with a predominantly outpatient clinical service, I continued doing outpatients. And I was particularly concerned that there was, whilst there was this tsunami of, of COVID on the horizon, we had all of our other patients that needed to be looked after. And normally the, the NHS is swamped with, with uh, clinical work at, in the emergency room uh, and, and our clinics struggle to keep up. So all of these patients that we normally looked after just disappeared. They were all uh, shielding or self-isolating through either advice of their doctors if they were shielding or they were self-isolating because those were the UK rules. And we had no patients. Uh, they were just weren't turning up to the emergency room either because they were uh, trying to manage their, their, their conditions on their own or they were too scared to come to hospital. And on those occasions when I was talking to patients on the phone as part of their virtual appointments, uh, managing their condition, if I felt concerned that they needed to be seen in a face-to-face -face assessment, a significant proportion of these patients refused to come into hospital because they were so worried that they were going to encounter COVID. Uh, and a lot of this was driven by uh, lack of understanding, uh, media frenzy, uh, and almost hysteria on occasions. So I, I focused all of my attention on supporting my patients uh, over the course of the pandemic to make sure that they had continuity of care and that they had easy access to a doctor, whatever their problem was. And uh, getting in to see their GPs was almost impossible. So primary care, uh, was to a large extent uh, uh, unobtainable for a lot of patients. So I was having to give advice for all sorts of things other than respiratory medicine, uh, largely to reassure and suggest when they did need to, to do something. Um, sorry, I've, I've lost. Uh, we, we, can, we can hear you okay. I'm not, uh, okay. You. I, I suddenly lost my screen. Um, so, uh, I discussed this with the, uh, the group that I sit on at the Royal College of Physicians in London, and, and this obviously had appeared on their radar, and this was in June, I think it was 2020. So it was starting to be appreciated that this represented a significant risk, that we were so focused on COVID that the usual, the usual care that we were providing was no longer, <clears throat> this was going to result in a huge backlog, which of course we're now seeing. Uh, and I suspect it's the same the world over. So that, that, was, our, that was our clinical experience, um, trying to manage things as, as well as possible remotely and seeing patients face-to-face uh, -face if they were unwell. We had empty beds in the hospital for a lot of the pandemic because it was just full of COVID patients. Our research and development department uh, shut down all research except COVID-related research. So I was able to, uh, to uh, commence the IARCO uh, research looking at the effects of COVID in alpha-1 patients. Uh, and uh, that, that now has come to an end, uh, although I suspect it may be something that we need to continue doing given the ongoing risks from COVID. But uh, we were only doing COVID research and we still are pretty much doing only COVID research uh, with a very slow recommencement of, of non-COVID research in, in the hospital. So I, I think that's probably the perspective that I can give uh, from our, our trust. And I suspect that it will be similar to a lot of trusts in the UK, but at the same time, there will be other trusts in places like Birmingham or London that were particularly hard hit where I think things may have been a lot worse. Thank you very much, David. That, that's really interesting. Mariano, you, your experience from Argentina? Yes, it is really a pleasure to be here sharing some experiences from Argentina regarding the diagnosis and treatment. 
uh, of alpha one patient during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, well, as you know, it's very important for, for patients to, to maintain augmentation therapy. But at the beginning of the pandemic, we had to take the drastic step of temporarily suspend the treatments or delay the treatments because of the restrictions and the quarantine in our country. But this gave us an important opportunity to switch the outpatient clinic uh, to home therapy in the vast majority of the patients. We first discussed the, the possibility of home therapy with them and when the patients agree with this possibility, a high level of adherence was certainly guaranteed with them. Uh, the few patients who remained in the outpatient clinic um, were treated in separate circuits, so they felt safe and uh, in a way to receive the therapy. And they were treated in a dedicated space, so they did not get in touch with other patients with other diseases, so they felt safe and they were assisted by staff who used the uh, proper personal protective equipment. During the pandemic, we, we tried to get in touch with patients through WhatsApps, emails, webinars, commented on the importance of maintaining the, the checkups and the, and, the, and the treatments and the importance of ensure physical activity as much as possible. Uh, regarding the, the screening programs in, in our country were uh, momentarily suspended, but uh, are currently being restarted and reinitiated. And um, well, during this time, we were able to establish our first national patient registry. So that is an important issue, uh, of course, in, in our country. That remains our, our important things during the pandemic. Thank you very much. That's, that's a very interesting insight. Uh, I'll move on now to, to Shane. Uh, your thoughts, Shane, on how you handled the uh, COVID-19? Um, well, actually, I shifted from one country to another so I could see uh, very different reactions in speed of anticipating the impact um, and adapt, adapting healthcare systems um, and people themselves, healthcare professionals and, and patients um, to manage this new unknown force which has hit our world. And of course the fear factor is huge for patients with respiratory diseases and one of the key things that we first started to work on was um, uh, a helpline which was reliable information because there was so much confusion, particularly uh, internationally about the way to go about handling COVID, what it meant, what it meant to your health, uh, the symptoms and, and so on. So that, that was a big part of the early stage of care support that we could offer from the foundation. Then apart from that, um, we realized that the, these digital care resources are so much more important now, where we can connect healthcare professionals with their patients in a timely manner to check on their progress. That's vital and I, I really do hope that this stays with us. I still have doubts because I don't believe that healthcare systems are yet equipped or are yet fully realizing that this is a big transformation that they're going to have to make. And with that transformation needs uh, a lot of training and a lot of support in switching culturally to how we connect with our physicians. One of the other key points in care, which is vital for patients is the inability to um, resume the, the necessary information that they need when they have that two minute exchange now <coughs> online with their GP or with their um, specialist, their pulmonary specialist. That information needs to be an immediate digital delivery so that it's easily understood by the physician and it makes sense to them to help take decisions together. And the timing is very brief. We're not going to run away from that. So. I, I really would like to think that the blended care model is going to be here to say and we can give it a lot more strength and value to the kind of care we, we need to be practicing in today's term. As far as research is concerned, it really does worry me what you've been saying, Sandy, and in our experience, we've 
had a, a setback of at least nine months in some of the studies that we were going to implement in hospitals. We've just managed to kick off with some of them after very lengthy de deliberation with the legal departments because they're not used to making uh, contracts for digital healthcare studies, but also the fact that we have to do online recruiting. The doctors, because of the, the delay in getting back to their patients, um, the backlog, they're not even seeing sufficient patients to recruit into studies. So the, the whole participation of, of people in the future of their health is vitally important that we change the mindset there, the culture, and we work together on these, these uh, very important items. Thank you very much and for, for some really interesting insights. Um, I can maybe share some of our experiences here in Ireland. Um, we obviously closed down our Alpha 1 clinic, our special Alpha 1 clinic, our cystic fibrosis clinic, and our general pulmonary clinics, uh, and we moved to remote clinics. They worked fairly well. Uh, we, we, we would contact our patients at home and ask how they were doing, etc. We couldn't do pulmonary function, obviously, but we did establish a good rapport with our patients and we were able to give them good quality advice. And what we did on top of that is, uh, and again, a lot of the credits should go to Geraldine and Tomas on this, the Alpha One Foundation in Ireland, which is based in our hospital, took it upon itself to talk to the patients on a regular basis and open up a hotline. So the patients had any questions, They'd send them in to us and we'd try as much as we could to answer the questions they had. In addition to that, we were fortunate in a bit like Argentina, the, the number of patients who get uh, infusions in our, or sorry, who get alpha-1 augmentation therapy in Ireland is quite small, but they get their infusions at home. So that was a big plus. They didn't miss their infusions in any way, shape or form. So that we were very pleased about that. The, the other thing where we played a good role, and I think Geraldine and Tomas might expand on this later, it, we pushed for vaccination. We, we tried to get our patients all the information about vaccination as much as possible. We told them what the potential side effects were so that in the event of a, an unexpected adverse event, they would not be surprised and they would then consider with us in getting the second vaccination. And I think that worked really well. Forewarned is forearmed. And we found that by keeping people in the loop, so to speak, we could encourage them without being too uh, punitive about it, that this was a good thing. Uh, with the guards, our own clinical work, uh, because our clinics were closed and because uh, we are pulmonologists, uh, we were in the front line of the pulmonary uh, service in our hospital. Uh, I was involved in evaluating patients as they came in uh, with potential COVID and in the intensive care unit. And we, we made a virtue out of necessity in that we started to look, we started to do research in COVID. And so we started to look at the inflammatory processes involved in COVID. We looked specifically at alpha-1 in COVID as well. We published on that. And we eventually planned and carried out a study on administering intravenous alpha-1 antitrypsin augmentation therapy to people with COVID who are not necessarily alpha-1 deficient. And the results of that, I hope, will soon be uh, out within the next few weeks. And they're interesting results. And I think it, it, it gave us a lot of insight into inflammation. And I think one of our people is doing a, a PhD or has finished a PhD on the inflammatory response of alpha-1 patients and non-alpha-1 patients to COVID infection. And the results are very interesting. So although it stopped our traditional research, it did give us opportunities to look at the acute inflammation and how the body responds to that, and specifically how your alpha-1 responds to that. So every cloud is a silver lining in that respect. But to, to put all this in context, in March 2020, I can remember really well being in Bethesda with Janine Darmiento, and I think Sandy, you were there too. Mm -hmm. And we were talking my about last trip. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this this COVID business and how important it might be, and maybe not. And I think if I'm being honest, I sort of said, I don't think it's that important. Yeah, there <laughs> and, you go, good, Jerry. <laughs> two years later. Uh, I would like to retract my comment. <laughs> These things happen. <laughs> anyway, have we any further questions, Adriana, for, from the group? Um, I, I'd just like to ask you all a question now, because, I mean, obviously this has been a, a big swing <laughs> from traditional practice to um, new digital logistic supply chains, which can change the way we can get people tested. Um, like you're saying, the home therapy is fantastic, but it's becoming much more of a reality in countries in Latin America and the US. And do you think that we'll be able to make a much stronger case 
to change the kind of care that people can expect uh, in the future as a result of this pandemic and the way we've had to switch. Well, speaking for myself, yeah, I absolutely agree. It's been a bit of a wake-up call for us to a, lot of, to a large extent. We've seen what we can do. We've seen what works. We've also seen what doesn't work. Uh, we've, we've seen some systems which have been touted as really good, not delivering. But the basic stuff, the contacting people, talking to them about what, what their problems are, even remote testing, such as measuring oxygen saturation, you can do remote spirometry, and you can certainly give home therapies. And home therapies, I think, have taken a big boost from, from our experience with COVID. It's not just with, uh, with uh, intravenous alpha-1, but intravenous antibiotics. So I, I think we're learning, and I think it's pushed us in the right direction, actually, uh, kicking and screaming maybe, but I think it's uh, community-based services will benefit from this, from our experiences, I hope. What do other people think about that? So um, I think it's a really interesting question. And um, there's been a lot of discussion a, a about this and the fact that it's, it's as with uh, um, people waking up to climate change as a consequence of, of events in the last couple of years, people have woken up to the, to the way in which we have been practicing medicine and how we should practice it. And it, it definitely, has made people think about what they could do and should do uh, as remotely as possible, not just in terms of um, making the experience better for patients, but making the system more efficient. Again, reducing the effect of climate change, because every time a patient makes a trip to hospital, that may be an unnecessary trip. But I have a number of concerns uh, about some people who think that this is going to completely revolutionize medicine and that we don't need to see our patients. So the first thing to say is you can never beat face-to-face -face contact with a, a, between doctor and patient. There is nothing that will replace that, um, not just in terms of building up a rapport and a, and a proper relationship and trust, but also um, allowing you to examine patients in a way that uh, is, is effective. So that, I think that's the, probably the most important thing. And one of the things that concerns me is that whilst it's possible to manage patients remotely when you know them well and when you're <clears> a very experienced clinician what's what's going to be the way in which younger doctors who are having to learn and build confidence to be able to make decisions and develop that sixth sense that you only get from decades of working closely with patients how are you going to train people to get those skills if it's all done over video and remotely. And I don't think that we've got an answer for that. Yeah, that's a very well, valid point. Yeah. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Sorry, uh, Shane, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, there's a huge push for artificial intelligence right now to come into the decision making, help support decision making process. I mean, mainly be because it's so overwhelming, <laughs> the amount of what you have as physicians. So I, I can really see how we need to be working in that direction with trusted AI not and over robust data. Um, maybe that will take some of the pressure out of and maybe some of the need for the clinical knowledge, that it, those years of experience. I don't know. Um, we're going to be ro robotized in some way. And it's very important actually that you all take the lead in this because it's your generation of physicians with the experience that may never be replicated in the same way. Medicine may be practiced quite differently looking forward and not in too, too far into the future. That's a good point. And I, I, although I agree with David that we, we cannot sacrifice the doctor-patient relationship on the back of what may seem to be a cheaper uh, um, solution. And I think it's very important that any such change is done uh, with the patient's interest at heart and it doesn't lose that personal touch that I think is so important in medicine. Sandy, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, my institution is run by accountants and lawyers. Um, and, um, you know, once the, uh, regulate, the temporary regulation expired that allowed us to, to call patients in states that we're not licensed in since licensing in the U.S. is state-based, they immediately said, okay, no more telemedicine. 
um, with uh, patients who are in states that you're not licensed to practice in. Now, we think that's being extended or it is has been extended. But the other aspect, of course, is that we can't charge um, at the institution for telemedicine the types of charges that we make for patients who come for a three-hour visit with an expert clinician at National Jewish. And so it doesn't matter to a certain extent in the institution that we could do a good job on many of our patients that we know well via telemedicine. They would rather those patients came in uh, to generate the income than yeah. an in-person meeting. Now, that's a cynical view of what's going on. I mean, there are, there are arguments from a from a patient care perspective on both of those issues and I and I don't mean to you know disparage everyone in the in the administration of the institution I work at but the but the fact is that those kind of considerations have come into play now as as uh, uh, tele after telemedicine had been done very well on the other hand they just put in a whole new system to facilitate telemedicine which for us means finally getting double screens where we can see the patient and look at their chart at the same time, which we didn't have before. Yeah. Mariano, you mentioned that in Argentina, there was home infusions. What are your thoughts about patients initiating the infusion process themselves? Self-administration of alpha. Yes, we, we only have one patient with self-administration, but uh, it's the only one in our country. They get used to to go to the outpatient clinic. Really, when when we were out of the pandemic, the pandemic before the pandemic, they really were used to go to the hospital. And if you offer them not to go to the outpatient clinic or or home therapy, they they really denied that possibility. But with the pandemic, they gave us a, a big opportunity to. To, to start the, the home the home therapy and they are really happy. Uh, regarding the issue of what can we learn related with the pandemic, uh, it's it's really uh, an an issue to to discuss. We uh, I'm not really sure because it it's if the if the system we really change a lot or not. For example, as David said before. At the beginning, the patient were really afraid of going to the hospital and to the emergency room. But uh, right now in Argentina, uh, there are no no restrictions or no quarantine at all, and and the patients are are going back, are coming back to the hospital, and with uh, and really we are we are really uh, attending and assisting a lot of patients. So that's that's the. The, the reality in, in our country. The, the, the other process is some people have switched to every two weeks administration, et cetera, and changing their, their forms of administration. So that's another opportunity as well. Uh, any further questions, Adrian? I'm quite aware we're over time, I suppose, but if you have any further questions, I'm sure people would be happy to answer. Um, but yeah, maybe I, we do them offline. I just wondered, um, I mean, most of the issues I think also have been social issues that you know disconnection the isolation of people which yes. is carrying on depending on the country and depending on the system and how overloaded it still is or how much backlog there is and i don't think that that's going to go away easily it was already an issue for people with respiratory diseases so um how do you think we should be handling that in our healthcare systems actually uh, from the patient organization perspective that's one of our key areas of support um, but how important do you think it is actually in an integrated care for alphas? Well, it's, it's one of the things we, we've learned for, for all people uh, attending hospitals or attending uh, outpatients that the, the personal touch and meeting with people who care is a big plus. I think meetings like this are very important, actually, because they ensure that the, the message is going out and the message is a, is a cohere, co coherent message. But I think uh, contact within the alpha-1 population by alphas to alphas is really important. I think that's probably more important in some ways than just talking to a doctor. And I think we should encourage that as much as possible. We are a community and we should act, act like that. And communities help each other by definition, I think. You know, the alphanet coordinators that are calling our patients every, every month um, 
have been very helpful to the uh, uh, to the thousands of patients that we follow, but it's also been a tremendous emotional drain on the coordinators themselves. And and uh, you know we're now turning our attention to maintaining the, you know we th we thought just because they've been working from home all along, that this would be no change for them, but the the change of having to deal not only with someone's typical alpha one health issues, but also with the emotional stress of both um, the isolation and the uh, and uh, friends and loved ones dying of COVID has been a tremendous strain on the on the coordinators. So I'll hand it back then to Randall and Adriana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation.